Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining me again this morning on Next on the T. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro, and today I have the honor and the privilege of having PGA Tour legend Bobby Nichols joining me. Mr. Nichols won 15 times on the PGA and Champions Tour, including the 1964 PGA Championship at Columbus Country Club. He's going to join us in just a few minutes, but before we get started, we want to kick off the show by saluting the brave men and women serving in our military and everyone listening in on the Armed Forces Sports Radio Network. We thank you for your daily sacrifice and all you do to keep the rest of us safe. We also want to thank those of you who serve or have served in every branch of the military and public service. We truly appreciate what you do to preserve our freedoms and our liberty. It's through your strength and efforts that our way of life is even possible. Our sincere thanks as well to Stephen Lee, Dennis Farrell, and all the folks at Armed Forces Sports Radio. It's an honor for us to be a part of your network. You can find our show by going to armedforcessportsradionetwork.org and also be sure to give those guys a follow on Twitter. You can find them at the AFRN for the Armed Forces Radio Network. I also want to mention our good friends, Mike Novaks, Ben Kerr, Mark Medeski, and the rest of the great staff over at LastWordOnSports.com. Check them out online and on Twitter. Their site's fantastic, folks. Contains great content across every sport. Their staff of writers is outstanding. You're going to love going to their site every day for your sports news. If you haven't been there yet, check it out and then bookmark it. LastWordOnSports.com. We also want to welcome our new listeners on iHeartRadio. We're excited to be on iHeartRadio now. Thank you, folks, for taking us in and letting us be a part of what you've got going on. We're excited to be there. You can find us by going to iHeartRadio.com and searching for Next on the T. And and you can uh, also find this show on radio sites across the Internet. You can find us on TuneIn, Spreaker, Blog Talk Radio, Stitcher, and Player.fm as well. So if someone's dragging you to the mall or to the grocery store or you're just tired of the same old, same old that you hear on your commutes every day, take us with you. You can give us, uh, you know, you can give us a listen. We'll give you something fun to focus on for a little while while you're out there. Enjoy your ride a little bit better. Maybe not, uh, you know, uh, be discouraged as much walking around the mall or going around the grocery store. Let us entertain you for a little bit. We're glad that uh, you'll listen to us, and uh, we hope you'll make us a party of your uh, every Saturday morning. We're here 9 a.m. every Saturday morning. All right, now joining me on the Kyvin Foods guest line is Bobby Nichols. Let me give you some details about Mr. Nichols' background. He's from Louisville, Kentucky, played his college golf at Texas A&M, where he won the Southwest Conference Individual Championship in 1952, was a Southwest Conference medalist in 1956, and team co-captain in 58. Joined the PGA Tour in 1960. He won 12 times on the regular tour, including the 1964 PGA Championship. He won three more times on the Champions Tour and was recently honored as a hometown hero uh, by uh, his hometown city of Louisville during the uh, PGA Tour week uh, a couple weeks back. I am both honored and privileged to have him with me next on the tee this morning. Mr. Nichols, thank you for joining me. Glad to be here. So, Mr. Nichols, you know, before we get into, you know, your wonderful playing career, as, as a Texas Aggie, you have to be excited about uh, how they kicked off the college fo- football season the other night, dominating South Carolina 52-28. Kevin Sumlin certainly has that program going in the right direction. He really does. It's amazing how good an offensive coach he's become, or he, I shouldn't say become, he always was like that. And to do what he did with South Carolina in the Columbia. And that first time they've lost in 18 ga- uh, games was quite a quite a feat, and proud of them. And uh, they got a lot of uncertainties, but they evidently uh, they're coming together and they're going to be a force. Yeah, yeah, they certainly are. Yeah, you, you're exactly right. I'm uh, I'm interested to see. You know, I think everyone thought that in the post uh, Johnny Manziel era, maybe there'd be a drop off. And according to what we saw the other night, there's no drop off coming. No, they got a lot of talent, and and uh, it it showed uh, last night. I think their depth is getting a lot better, and that that pays off in the SEC. Obviously, you got to have that, and uh, right. so everything's looking up. But hopefully, everything stays bare. Everybody stays healthy and continue to uh, yeah. do well. Yeah, yeah, no, th- no doubt that's the key. All right, so. Let's talk about, you know, your wonderful career. I read you started playing golf at age 13, but actually started caddying at age 9. How did you get started caddying? 
Well, actually, I had to find a way to make a dollar or two, and that's about what happened. That's why I started caddying. We'd make about a dollar, a dollar and a quarter a day, which was wonderful. Back then, at least he gave us something, some kind of a job. And and uh, being around it, caddying, first thing, one thing led to another. I started playing. But I think a lot of uh, guys in my era uh, started the same way, uh, caddying, and uh, picked up the game in that, in that way. You actually caddied for another prominent Louisvillian and Baseball Hall of Famer, Pee Wee Reese, right? I sure did. He used to uh, uh, caddy at the club that he was a member at in Louisville, Kentucky, and when he came home on the off season, he'd always play. Pee Wee was a very good player. He was one handicap, and he could play to it, too. He was very, just a natural athlete, and uh, it was really, uh, really special to be able to caddy for him. Did you ever have any uh, you know, thoughts of, you know, hey, maybe uh, teeing it up on the tour for a little bit? Oh, Pee Wee, I, I don't think he could have done any better than what he did in baseball. He was, <laughs> he was, uh, <laughs> I think he picked the right sport. He's, golf was kind of an all-season diversion for him, but uh, he was very good, like I say, athletic. It, so he was very good at almost anything he wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I also read you had another uh, early brush with greatness because you were good friends with Paul Horning, double dated with him, in fact, right? Well, yeah, we uh, did it on a couple of cases back in our high school days, and uh, I think when we was growing up, we always wanted to be like he, him and be like Paul Horning, but not too many people were. He was kind of a special athlete. I don't like a lot of people know, but uh, Paul was a very good basketball player too in high school. Uh, and there again, he was just a natural athlete; could do most anything, and that uh, he took up to try. So uh, now he's played a lot of golf and, and enjoyed it, and something that he didn't get a chance to do too much in high school. But uh, yeah, let's say he's playing a lot of golf now and, and having fun. You uh, you won the Kentucky State Championship as a senior in high school, which means you started playing golf at 13, and within four or five years, you're already the best player in the state. That's You know, you want to talk about someone who's got amazing natural talent. That's fantastic. You know, I, I always say, you say to folks, golf is, is a sport that takes 10 years just to get bad at. But you, all of a sudden, you're, you're state champion four or five years. How'd you do it? Well, it... it uh... Back in our days, we never had a swing coach. We never had very much of a tutoring. Right. But we picked it up just by watching other players and good players play. And that's about the way you, you uh, kind of improved your game. Since three times a charm, you had a third brush with greatness with uh, Coach Bear Bryant. Talk about how you, you, know, you met him and how your relationship with him developed because he was the one that helped get you to Texas A&M, right? Yeah, I owe Coach Brown a great deal. He and I'm not by myself, but he's done this for a lot of a lot of his players and stuff through the years. But he gave me a scholarship to Texas A&M in '54, and really, he uh, uh, after I had my accident, he could have thrown me on the bus, bus, bus rather, and forgotten. But he gave me a golf scholarship. Actually, he was the athletic director and football coach when he went to Texas A&M. So. He uh, had the whole sports program, and so he gave me a golf scholarship. Uh, but it was, it was a football scholarship because golf in those days did not have a full ride. Only sports that had a full ride for football and basketball. So by giving me a football scholarship, I had a free ride to Texas A&M. Yeah, so that's that's the thing, right? To your point. The, it was a football scholarship, and you came around once in a while to practice, right, to, to, to check out what yeah. was going on. But it was a football scholarship that got you there to be able to play golf, which is, which is yeah. I guess, unusual and fantastic that he was willing to do that for you. I uh, know it was. It, uh, it was a special type of situation, and uh, he, he did it for me. And, I, I you know, I can't say enough about him. And through the years, when I first went to Texas a and he called me in his office, and he said, now, uh, anytime you have some free time, he said, I want you to come out and say howdy to the boys and, and just uh, hang out with them and that sort of thing. And I said, yes, sir. So I did that. And then after we got out of college or after I got out of college in 58, he went to Alabama. And uh, we know what the history that he had in Alabama. He went in six right. national championships, and he was about three or four runner-ups. And uh, it was amazing uh, the years. Anyways, we... 
he took up golf in 1960 when he left Texas A&M and went to Alabama, and he uh, started playing the game and really, really liked the game. Um, and everybody, of course, wanted him to play in either fundraisers or, or charity events that went on throughout the years. And yeah. So he tried to oblige as much as possible. And I played, I must have played at least 12 or 15 different uh, charity events with him at different locations and different tournaments and stuff. And it was really, I got to know him on a personal, really a personal basis and and what a gentleman he was to me and to Nancy, my wife, and uh, the whole family, everybody. And uh, throughout his years at Alabama, he was a, he had a connection with a company called Ziegler Packing Company. And every Christmas, he would send me uh, a dozen steaks, of LA, FLAs, a dozen New York steaks, and uh, some more other stuff. And it was just something he sent uh, out of, I don't know, just uh, out of kindness, you might say. And then... Another wonderful thing he did for me back in the '69 and '70, he went, he came to the Masters, and I was playing. My birthday is April the 14th, so I'm my birthday usually fell in the Masters time, and he had a big, huge cake out in front of the Masters where the big trees are. If you've been to Augusta, you know what, what, yeah. what I'm talking about. It was uh, yeah. anyway. He had I had a big uh, long table there, and he'd say, "Happy birthday, Bobby." And then pros would come along, players would come along, have a piece of cake and so forth. But that's just another way of wow. uh, his uh, kindness to me. And I, it's you know, it just uh, all I can say is wow. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fantastic. Good for you, <laughs> Mr. Nicholson. Uh, no, finish your thought, please. No, no, I, I'm, I'm finished pretty much. I just. Okay. Uh, Things like that, uh, you, it was just uh, really special, Coach Brown. Of course, he, like I say, he had he had a lot. He did a lot of stuff for a lot of players, especially ones that played for him, and he knew. And he was just that kind of a man. He just uh, he he uh, he gave back to his players. He he, would, he appreciated uh, what they did for him and so forth. I remember that when they, when he went to Junction in '54, and he had all the players, and he came back with only 29. Out of '98, that stayed and played for him, uh, Junction Boys. They gave him right. a ring uh, after, uh, oh, I don't know after what year it was, maybe sometime in the late '60s. And they gave him a ring, and he wore that ring even when he was playing golf. He never took that ring off. I don't think he he always wore it even when he was swinging a golf club and stuff. And of course, and we had national championships. He that ring was the one he always wore. Or at least whenever I saw him, he had it on. And, uh, right. but, and of course, he got rings for every time he won a national championship and stuff like that. But uh, it was a special thing for him and a special feeling that he had for those players back in uh, 1955. Wow, that's a great story. Yeah, he, and, when um, he was. Uh, when he, uh, that, that, uh, I think the Junction boys all admired him. They. You might say it was a hate, love-hate relationship, but they loved him after, after they got through and going through all the trials and tribulations, the good times right. and the bad times. Right. Um, Nineteen fifty-two, you win the Southwest Conference Championship. Was that a moment in your life when you looked at it and said, "You know what? I I could probably make a go of being a professional golfer and be successful at it if I wanted." Well, I don't. I don't know. Maybe I'm sure it had a. Some thoughts in my mind. You never know exactly. There have been such many, so many good players that uh, have tried the game and, and didn't succeed. I might say, but uh, there have been other players you think didn't have much of a chance, and all of a sudden they succeeded. So it, golf it draws a very fine line from being a, 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 a normal player and being a superstar, I should say, or a super player on the tour. Right. So it's it's, uh, it's a lot has to do with dedication and 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 mental. Uh, uh, preparation and uh, it it was a situation where I was fortunate enough because when I went to work in Midland Country Club out in West Texas, I got to uh, play with uh, Mr. Hogan in Fort Worth, Texas, because the, the, the pro that I worked for in Midland, Texas, was a on the staff of the Hogan staff, and so we went to Fort Worth a few times to play with Mr. Hogan. That was that was a highlight of our career at that time. And uh, so it helped me a great deal just to uh, have that uh, knowledge of uh, watching him play and thinking, well, maybe I could 
do a little bit of what he's doing, so uh, I wanted to give it a try. And I want to talk in, in, in a minute about your experiences with Mr. Hogan because I read some interesting things. I want to get to that in just a minute. But you you sort of burst onto the tour in 60. You had two top 10s, eight top 25s, and 28 starts. And you were a powerful golfer for the time. I read a comparison that said that you were John Daly-like long back in 1960. Talk about, you know, your swing and, and, and being able to overpower some courses. Well, it, 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 by, in those days, I helped. To hit the ball a little further maybe than normal, but uh, again you had to keep it in the fairway, and I probably wasn't the most accurate driver, but uh, and I think uh, by hitting it a, a, a little longer than normal that it helped helped me uh, a great deal. So uh, uh, a lot of a lot of players uh, could hit it a long ways and stuff, but there was only a few players that really could uh, keep it in the fairway, and I think one of the best drivers. That we had back there, it's obvious. It's Jack Nicholas, who was who was a pre uh, the, the premier player, and uh, right. so uh, it, it, you know we had like I said a lot of good long hitters, not not a lot, but a few. But today it's uh, pretty common. Players are yeah. all extremely long. It's just amazing. You got your first two wins on tour in '62 at the St. Petersburg Open, and then later at the Houston Classic. And I'm guessing. For a guy who went to Texas A&M, the Houston Classic must have been like winning a home game. Was the crowd going crazy for you? Yeah, I was pretty fortunate there because uh, A&M is full of, uh, or rather, uh, Texas is full of uh, Aggies, obviously, but uh, yep. especially around Houston area, and I had won a couple times there, over 62 and, and 65. But uh, what I remember, first of all, in 1961, I won my first tournament. I played uh, the final round with Doc Kerry Middlecoff, Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't remember Doc Miracle, but Doc was one of the best players in that era that there was. He won 40 events, and this was a tremendous player. A couple of U.S. Opens and the Masters. He was really helpful to me and through the years we played together. and Along with Tommy Bold, I can name, and Mr. Hogan, I played a quite a few practice rounds with. and uh, We were lucky in our era. We got to play with the, the best players in those days, like Byron Nelson and and uh, uh, we can, Jimmy the Bear. We, I mean, we could go on forever. Every yeah. good player that we played with back in there, we got a chance to play with. So that was really, really a special time. Yeah, I read that you, you, um, when you won the St. Petersburg Open, you were playing with uh, you know, Kerry Medelkoff, and you, you credited him with helping you out a great deal. You mentioned it a second ago. What role did he play for you, and what were the things that he did and gave to you that helped you with your game? Well, what? Every time we played a practice round together, and especially at the Masters, he always let me play a practice rounds with him, and he would tell me where to hit the shot or try to hit the ball and, and play this side and that side. And uh, a couple of things I'll never forget, like number 12 at the amen corner is the par three, and there's right. a trap right in the middle of the, of the green, in front of the green, brother. And he right. said, you see that trap? He said, you hit the, every time, no matter if the pin is extreme right or extreme left or in the back, you fired right over that bunker. And all the years I played the Masters from uh, 61 to about 78, uh, I played about 18 or 19 straight. And I never put it in the water there. I always put it out over that, that uh, sand trap and got it either on the green or over the green, but never made worse than four and made a lot of twos and a lot of threes. But uh, that always been disastrous for quite a few players through the years and, and uh it's Indeed. awful tempting to try to fire it in there on the right side or left side, but the water comes in the big time in play, and you got to hit a absolute carry perfect to be able to uh, negotiate that. So putting it right over top of the middle of that bunker was really a big, big plus uh, education. You got your fourth and fifth wins in 64, including a wire-to-wire win at the 64 PGA Championship at Columbus Country Club in Columbus, Ohio, so Jack's backyard. What was it like trying to win a home game for Jack, and not only beating Jack, the other guy that finished tied for second with him was Arnie at the height of his popularity. Talk about bringing that that, uh, championship home. Yeah, that was uh, that was a special week, and I got to play with Mr. Hogan there in the final round, and uh, that was a tremendous uh, plus. And then later on that same year, uh, the World Open was held in Oakland Hills there in Birmingham, Michigan, and uh, one day I was playing with Mr. Hogan. 
that uh, that tournament. And so uh, there are two, two tournaments that I won both times. I played with Mr. Hogan, which was special. And uh, it was uh, when we checked out the hotel the next day, uh, the Bradison Hotel there in Birmingham, uh, I saw him. And I stood back when he was check at checkout counter. After that, he turned around, he looked at me, and he said, you ought to pay me to play with you. And I said, <laughs> well, there's a guy, the best player in the world at the time, or certainly one of the best. Uh, saying that to me, it was quite it was quite an honor. Of, so, uh, <laughs> I read that your response was, back to that was, I don't know what it would cost me, but I'd sure try. <laughs> right. <laughs> he was... Uh, he was also special to me also. He uh whenever I he'd show up at a golf tournament, which wasn't very many after after the sixty four, but in a few tournaments, uh, he he'd look at me and I'd I'd always try to get in his way. I knew where he was coming to the golf course and so forth, whatever, and I'd try to walk in his way. He'd say he'd look at me and say, Go get your partner and we'd play <laughs> and that's that's basically how I'd, I try, I got to play with him a lot of practice rounds and stuff. That's great. You, uh, you mentioned earlier all the great players that you had an opportunity to play with, and I think I and most people, when they look back at the era of golf that you played, and we call it the golden era. So some of the other players that don't get as much recognition but were great players you know, in their own way are guys like Gabe Brewer, Billy Casper, Tommy Bolt. Um, talk about the, you know, how great those players were, and, and maybe you know, the four of you, not getting as as much recognition for being great players as you probably you know earned. Yeah, I, I think that happens. Uh, well, you brought up the perfect uh, person, Billy Casper, who won 53 events, which is that's amazing in that there in itself. And you know he and Gene Littler, and you could go on Don January, uh, that, uh, and Tommy Bolt, and guys that um, you talk about. You could just the era. The, Guys, you could just name of fifteen or twenty or even more, right? That really never, never got. I'd say the limelight. It, well, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't available in those days until TV came along in about sixty-two or three. And uh, by then, a lot, a lot of the guys were on the downhill of their career, but uh, uh, they were still very well respected in players in our days. So plus, what I enjoyed most of all was not only being around them. And uh, having fun with them and telling jokes and this and this and that is they they would try to help you. It was uh, you can ask them any questions you wanted, and they would uh, they would try their best uh, to help you out and and uh, or try to answer or do anything that could to help you. It wasn't we all were competing against each other, but at the same time we enjoyed uh, we try to help each other, which I think is a special back in those days and. Uh, but of course, today you got your own personal coaches and things, and what, uh, so you don't really right. have that sort of thing too much. I'm sure they get guys today do the same thing pretty much. So, you know, you, you, like we say, we talked about so many great players that you had the opportunity to play with. I'm curious, I and mean, you say you played so many practice rounds with Mr. Hogan, but when you look at um, getting, you know, the pairings, you know, at the at the tournaments, and as you guys traveled around together, because again, this is the, you know. A, a bygone era, right? These guys today have their own jets and they fly here, there. But you, a lot of you guys traveled together and played lots of rounds together. Who were some yeah. of the guys when you saw the pairing shoots come out saying, you know what, this is going to be a fun round of golf. I really like playing with him. Well, we never did really have – I never had any confrontation with any of the players. I got along with mostly all of them. Excuse me. I got along with most all of them and that sort of thing. And maybe occasionally – you feel like you could play a little better with that individual, that but no one in particular that I feel like that had I was flat. But I was trying to make the best out of every pairing I had, and uh, and it worked out well. We didn't, uh, we never had any, any really serious problems. Uh, sometimes uh, um, maybe you might feel a little more comfortable. I know when I was playing with Mr. Hogan in the final rounds of the tournaments that. Uh, it was uh, he was a person that would put you at ease. He was, uh, and the crowds itself were very respectful and followed along and, and applauded his every swing and so forth. But they didn't. Uh, it wasn't any hollering and yelling and that sort of thing. It was really a, a controlled, uh, respectful crowd, and that that mm-hmm. helped a lot in a lot of ways. So. Uh, 
You, when you won the the PGA in '64, you won eighteen thousand dollars. Rory McIlroy, for for his win a couple of weeks ago, won one point eight million dollars. Can you believe how much the purses have grown in the last fifty years? Well, the well, funny thing is, you you should bring that up. I told Roy after he won that the PGA had one point one one point eight million. Uh, I said, Roy, you and I got something in common in our in our prize money when we won the PGA. I said, oh, my numbers are the same as yours. It's just I don't have as many zeros. <laughs> I said, I won eighteen grand, and he won one point eight million. So he, I thought, what is that, hundred times more, something like that. Right. So it was a, uh, it was pretty special. He laughed like that. It was, it was, it was kind of funny that would, that should happen. <laughs> But uh, you yeah, played, with that. yeah, with all that? the all the tournaments back in those days, it's just tremendous how it's grown. Yeah, so I gotta, you know, I I think you know you're early on. You you finished ninth on the money list, and and uh, your your you know, I think your first season out, and you won thirty four thousand dollars. When when you like when you look back at that thirty four thousand, did you feel like you were rich back in the day with thirty four thousand dollars? Yeah, a certain extent, I felt like you know, I was successful and I could uh, I could live on it and. Uh, I wasn't uh, about to retire on it. <laughs> right, it was, right. Uh, yeah, I, I, luckily, when I won tournaments, I won the, the World Open at, in 64 was the first $200,000 tournament, and then the first 300000 was in 70, and that was the Dow Jones uh, tournament. And I got a story to tell you about the Dow Jones in 1970. Yeah. After I won that, I got a, a letter from Bobby Jones. And I opened it up, and I didn't realize he had sent me a clipping. It was from the Charlotte, Charlotte Observer, and it said at the byline, it says, had a picture of me winning the tournament. And in the bottom, it said, Bobby Jones wins Dow Jones. And so he <laughs> sent me that he sent me that clipping in the paper. And I looked at it, and I was surprised to see that. And he said, also sent me a little note. He said, Dear Bobby, congratulations on your win. Sorry for the misidentification, but you have the check. Congratulations and continued <laughs> success. Bobby Jones, he signed it. And I have that was 1970. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, uh, you got that framed in, in, the, in, in the office somewhere, in the den? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, we, and, uh, I got a couple of telegrams from Mr. Hogan. We won uh, well, first uh, one of the PGN 64 Lou Strong was president of the PGA, and he he uh, asked me the next year. He said, "Bobby, he said we want to have a dinner, bring back all the past champions. Would you be the MC for the tournament?" And uh, I said, "Well, I'd love to, yeah." He said, "Well, we're going to have it at Laurel Valley, side of the 65 PGA, and would you be the MC?" So all the past champions, or most all of them, Gene Sarris and Paul Runyon, now we went back to Claude. Uh, Chandler Harper and the guys and then they shoot guys who won in the thirties. They were all were there. It was really amazing the turnout. Byron Nelson, I mean you can say I'm saying, I mean Mr. Hogan was the only person that wasn't there and I could understand why. A lot of people don't realize that but he I think he got hurt in that accident. It took him forever. He had to wear braces on both of his legs. And it took him a good hour and hour and a half just to be able to prepare himself to be able to play and stuff. And so it was really a burden, and he couldn't stand too long a period of time. He could he could walk, but, you know, he, the standing was not a not a thing he wanted to do much of. So he sent me a telegram apologizing for not being there for the dinner, and that was really special. I have that, plus, uh, like I said, uh, the letters and things I got from him and also that one from Bobby Jones. That was really special. Wow, and, uh, that's great stuff. Yeah, he. I was pretty fortunate. I, a lot of good things happened, and through golf and uh, and through life and things, and still uh, having to meet those people. I want to say one other thing about Jack and Arnold when they when they we played there in the '64. Uh, mm-hmm. I remember Jack played with him, and, and our, we were standing there talking or something, and he overheard, overheard him say. You know, the crowds at the uh, 64 PGA in Columbus was so big, and it was well, one of the reasons, not only for Jack and Arnold, but our, uh, Mr. Hogan was there, and he was on the kind of the twilight of his career. The crowds were enormous, and uh, he said, you know, I saw this. 
And I said, this town needs another tournament, and, and that's why he had the idea of building a more, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, a uh, uh, memorial uh, tournament down right. the uh, the golf course there. And so that's why that's how he got the idea of building. And uh, it was... Uh, Muirfield? Muirfield. I couldn't think of Muirfield. I don't know why. But right. uh, I kept saying memorial tournament. It wasn't memorial. It was Muirfield. Anyways... He, he that's how he came around to be a the thought of building Mirrorfield. Interesting. So mm-hmm. let's uh let's talk a little Ryder Cup. You you played in the you know, the Ryder Cup in sixty seven and uh you know, once upon the time the Ryder Cup was sort of built theoretically as an exhibition, which, you know, certainly not it's it's no exhibition now. I'm curious, was was the rivalry and pressure to win the Ryder Cup as intense when you played as it appears to be now? Well, I don't think it uh, had the world. I don't. It was good, very good. In fact, it was quite an honor. And we had all the preliminary functions and everything and to make it a, a kind of a special event and respectful to play for your country. But, it, you know, media today, uh, well, like it is, they've, they've uh, kind of make it like it's a, it's a battle. Well, it is a battle in a friendly way, and uh, it probably gets more publicity, obviously, because of the uh, uh, national uh, players from all over the world now. We mm-hmm. had players from all over the world, but not as many different countries as they do now. And uh, there again, Mr. Hogan was our captain. That was really another special feat. And uh, We had a unique situation back then we could, uh, that we could play the regular size ball, or they could play the or the small ball, which uh, right. people down in the days hadn't heard of that, but back then you could play the small ball, which they played in Europe. And uh, we had an opportunity to have that option, but we all played the small ball because uh, Mr. Hogan said, well, and somebody asked him, well, which ball should we use, Mr. Hogan? And he said, well, you can't hit that little ball out in the fairway. <laughs> so we... Uh, <laughs> We all kind of laugh. Well, maybe you can't, but we can. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that was another fun uh, honor to have him as captain. And we won by the largest you, margin ever. Uh, right. Still a record by the margin that we won by. But uh, we we had a tremendous uh, uh, Ryder Cup. Every every Ryder Cup has tremendous uh, team. So it was uh, it was special. You you and Johnny Potts were paired together, and you guys won all of your matches together. Plus, you earned a point and a half yourself in the singles matches. So, for a rookie, you know, Ryder Cup experience, you had a heck of a time. Yeah, we did. We uh, we were forced, and we won our all matches, and and uh, it was a uh, it was just fun. And of course, Johnny Potts was a tremendous player and partner, so uh, it made it uh, even that much more fun and, and enjoyment. You played, you know, fast forward a bit, but you, you played on the senior tour. Now the, the champions tour starting, you know, uh, back in 86, tour established in, in 80. So it was still relatively in its infancy. What did it mean to you and the guys from your era to sort of have a second life on tour? Well, I, it's, uh, it was a pleasant surprise. Obviously, we all kind of didn't have anything much to do uh then, he, then that senior tour come along in '86, and uh, it was really, uh, really something special for us all. It was really a pleasant surprise, and no one even had any idea something like this would happen for the 50 and over group. And uh, but it came along, and and it started out in actually '78 with the uh, uh, two uh, two tournaments, and it went and it went to about four or six tournaments in 1980, and it has right. kept growing. But the guys that really got it off the ground was when it showed on TV. NBC picked up the uh, TV when they had Tommy Boat and Art Wall playing. I think it was Julius Boris and Roberto Davidson. So, and they were they showed it on TV, and, sh- and people saw that players 50 and over they could still play pretty well. And so that kind of shut. Uh, Got it off the ground, and then, it, it, like I say, it just kept getting bigger and bigger each and every year. And uh, of course, now it's uh, it's really gotten uh, big, which is it's like a mulligan, I guess you could say, for the fifty and fifty year olds. And there's some <laughs> players there, and plenty of them are playing better now than they ever did. 
Right. And uh, that's that's uh, a plus. And so uh, it's a plus all the way around. It keep, sure. Keep you active after 50 over. And uh, and, and actually, uh, I made more money on the senior tour than I made on the regular tour. Right. <laughs> and those few times. And, uh, but it was really uh, a special uh Special time, and it, it, it kept you out there with guys that you kind of grew up with, and uh, you met a lot of new people and a lot of uh, people that you uh, played with or knew, and he, he, he just kept meeting more and more friends and making friends and friendships and things. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, was it was was the senior tour more fun? than playing on the regular tour, or was the competition and the pressure to win just as much because you're playing against the same guys you had been playing against your whole career? So you still yeah, want to I be. I think the, the pressure is always there, but uh, you want, want to win. You're playing against guys that you try to beat all through your career. And another plus, you know, when you're on the senior tour, you could kind of plan your schedule because there was no cut. So you know you were going to play on the weekends. And therefore, right. you could uh, kind of schedule or make your schedule a lot easier, and it made it a lot more relaxing for you, and so forth. So it was a lot more. The atmosphere was much more relaxing, and and uh, so forth. But yet, yet it was very competitive because you. Uh, well, you know, I don't think you ever lose that competitive spirit once you've done it for so many years. It right. kind of stays stick with you, and it and it did for the senior tour, very much so. In '89, you you won the Southwestern Bell Classic. So, was was that win just as satisfying as any other tournament win, probably outside of the PGA Championship for you? Well, it was a fun, it was a exciting and fun to to win. I mean, it, it's always nice to win, no matter when or how, and whatever. Right. But uh, you know, it, it was it was it was fun. It was uh, not a whole lot of money, but it was it was just nice nice to win. Of course. Uh, like I say, the money was was very not minimal back then, but it uh, it got better as the years went on, and and of course now the senior tour has really uh, gotten full blown pretty much, and uh, it's it's pretty attractive for uh, even the players today, which uh, which uh, they're they're have made a lot more money than we did back in those days, but uh, it's still been it's still attractive to those guys. You were recently recognized, like I said in the intro, as a hometown hero earlier this month in Louisville during PGA Championship Week. You know, it being right there at Valhalla. What what was it like when you heard? You know, someone contacted you to say, you know, Mr. Nichols, we're uh, we're going to recognize you as a hometown hero during this week. That had to be a special moment for you. Well, I actually didn't know too much about about. Uh the uh, posters that they were putting up, murals or rather murals they were putting up out kind of different yeah. buildings in town. I had heard that there was this happening, but I didn't realize what magnitude it was or how popular it was until they contacted me. And, and, and then, of course, I got more and more involved and saw what was going on. And I, it, it was really, I said, wow, that's, that's, even, that's pretty special to even be considered for something like that. And I, so one thing led to another. We talked and this and that, and got they, they got well. They did everything. All I did was show up and uh, a couple speeches, that sort of thing. But uh, it was quite an honor. And the guys, excuse me, the people that we were with were uh, uh, well. It's an honor just to be with them in that same category. And uh, and now they can uh, see my mug every time they pass down Waters Expressway. That's the worst. Oh, just off of there in Louisville, Kentucky. And I, so when I passed down there, I looked up and I said, "Wow, this I know that guy." <laughs> but it, it's been quite a nice, quite a nice thing. I'm very happy for it. I really, uh, I don't know what else to say. Is I just uh, it's it's an honor, and uh, it'll always be there, and hopefully, and and uh, but uh, it was it was special, no doubt. Before we let you go, Mr. Nichols, I, I wanted to give you an opportunity as well um, to talk about, <clears throat> pardon me, the foundation that you you are, uh, have set up, Fiddlesticks. Can you uh, tell our listeners about that and how they can uh, check it out online and get more information and get involved? Yeah, we started this uh, charity event. Uh, Fiddlesticks Country Club members started and asked me if I would 
like to be involved. I said, yes, sure. And that started in 2003, and uh, we started out kind of slow like any charity event does and so forth. And after 11 years, we raised uh, $6.5 million just from the fellow six members and all who, who uh, got were involved. And it all goes to abuse and neglected kids here in southwest Florida. And uh, we have nobody on the payroll, and everything that we earn, or rather everything we uh, given to us and uh, so forth, goes right directly to the organizations. Abuse and counseling, and, and uh, then we also have the uh, blessings in the backpack where we give kids uh, food over the weekends when they're not going to school, and uh, it's been a really a, a blessing. We also got uh, uh, Justin Rose and Jason Duffner on the regular tour. They're involved with the blessings in the backpack, and uh, but uh, it's it's really been uh, really a special sort of thing. And uh, just to have the uh, feeling and honor to be able to help help kids and uh, hopefully make a better life for them. Uh, who who have been abused and neglected? Uh, it's, it's it's a great feeling, and uh, I feel very honored to be associated with such a successful charity event. And the people here at Field Sticks uh, Country Club have just uh, gotten behind the tournament and just have been unbelievably supportive. Yeah, you've got a lot of you know your your former peers too, right on tour that uh, get involved. You got the the Bobby Nichols the Fiddle Six Charity uh, Foundation, and you guys have a tournament every year. Um, I was taking a look online, uh, Nick, uh, NicholsCup dot org. Great stuff. Uh huh. Yeah, they uh, it's like I say, the players. I think sometimes they're not uh, honored enough for for the time they give to charity and, and try to raise money for different organizations around the country. But the golfers are in a unique situation. Uh they're able to help out in that category. It's, you know, I think I always felt like golf has really has an advantage over other sports as far as uh raising money for charity and different things. Is because when uh, people give their money to those charities, uh they're able to do something in return like play golf and have fun. Uh, it's pretty hard to uh, do much uh, other than just have festivities and and give you money. As other sports, it's been great, and all other sports do raise a heck of a lot of money. But golf is unique in that it, you're able to participate in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, it was, uh, I was like I say, I was very impressed. I remember taking a look at the website again. It's nickelscup.org. And uh, some of the players that you had playing in the charity event last year, I remember seeing uh, Mr. Jacklin in there, Fuzzy Zeller, Johnny yeah. Bench, to just to, to name a few. But you had a lot of great players. It looks like a fantastic event. It is. And Johnny, uh, like a, well, all, the, all the great players that you mentioned play with, plus others. And, and uh, Johnny Bench does uh, what a, a tremendous job he does. Of course, not only being probably the, uh, argue, arguably the best catcher in baseball ever, but he 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 does a lot of charity work, and especially in our and he does all the live auction for us. And he uh, he has been a catalyst for our tournament, and and he's done it every year since we started. And uh, hopefully he continues, and I think he will forever because uh, he's so good with with charity of raising money and uh, doing things for uh, giving back for uh, being who he is and uh, giving back some of his time and uh, monies and so forth. That's wonderful. Mr. Yeah. Nichols, thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday morning to be a part of the show. You're fantastic. I hope you'll come back and join me again sometime. I'd love to get your thoughts on you know, what's going on around the tour nowadays and hear some more of the stories from back when you played, but uh, I can't thank you enough for being generous with your time and uh, being a part of the show this morning. Well, yeah, thanks for the kind words, and uh, any time I'd love to talk about things that uh, this uh, tour and whatever, uh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. All right. Take care, Mr. Nichols. Uh, all the best to you and your family, and I look forward to catching up with you again, hopefully real soon. Thanks good, Chris. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Wow. Now that's an incredible honor. Bobby Nichols, 
again, the, uh, the site for his foundation and the great stuff that they're doing is Nichols, and that's N-I-C-H-O-L-S, so NicholsCup.org. Great stuff online there. Get involved. He's, uh, he's doing some wonderful things. All right, folks, it's uh, time to put a ball on this one. My sincere thanks to Mr. Nichols for being such a wonderful guest with me this morning. I thank you for tuning in. We appreciate you guys the most. Please also check out our sister show, Thursday Night Tailgate, uh, with me and my co-host, Bob Lazeri, our announcer, Joe Lajanusa. That show airs live every Thursday night from 8 to 10 p.m. on uh, on Blog Talk Radio. Uh, also, on, you'll find it on Spreaker.com. Tune in. We uh, also are rebroadcast live from uh, 10.30 to 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time over on Boost Radio. So check us out there as well. We are joined every week by legends from around the both the NFL and the CFL. Please also check out both shows on Facebook. Next on the T Thursday Night Tailgate, give us a like. That's important to us, too. You can find us online here, next, next on the T.net and ThursdayNightTailgate.com. You can stream or download any of our archive episodes. Keep up to date with uh, who our future guests are going to be. And by going on our Facebook pages, if there's a question that you want us to ask, whether it's on Thursday Night Tailgate or here next on the tee to one of our guests, please let us know. We'll be glad to get uh, that question answered for you on the air. All right, folks, thanks again for listening in to the show today. Like I say, we appreciate you guys the very most. Until next week, hit them straight, my friends.